after discussing few issues about uh, uh, computational uh, aspects like numerical integrations, uh, model reduction and uh, coupling techniques that is substructuring techniques. Uh, towards the end of the last class we return to the theme of uh, development of structural matrices for different types of elements and we started discussing uh, issues related to modeling of uh, uh, plane elements, plane stress and plane strain elements. So, we will continue with uh, the discussion. So, we can quickly recall we talked about uh, plane stress models where we have a prismatic object uh, carrying in plane loads there is no loading in the z direction there is no body force and no surface traction. So, that means these edges are free from uh, surface tractions only these edges are loaded. Uh, so, what we do is we write the boundary conditions on these edges which are uh, traction free and these are the boundary conditions there is no normal stress and there are no shear stresses and on uh, uh, the edge which is carrying load the loading is independent of z. Uh, we presume that the thickness of this object is small in relation to the lateral dimensions. So, based on that we interpolate that these features that are strictly valid at the boundaries are true in the interior also. So, that would mean we get sigma zz, zx, zy to be identically equal to 0 for all xyz in the do domain omega and similarly this uh, sigma xx, yy and xy which were independent of z on the boundaries now become independent of uh, z throughout the uh, interior. So, this is the basic uh, um, postulate of a plane stress model and from this we use uh, the constitutive law and get the strains and then use strain displacement relations and arrive at model for displacement. So, uh, resulting from uh, that analysis uh, we saw that there will be 10 unknowns in this model 3 stress components, 3 strain components and uh, um, three displacement components. I think there will be one more uh, component x, epsilon x y. Now, there will be two equilibrium equation four stress strain relations and four strain displacement relations. So, the number of unknowns and number of equations match and these are these equations and based on that we will be able to compute the strain energy in the body. Now, Another uh, two dimensional model which again we briefly touched upon towards the end of the previous lecture is a plane strain model. So, here again the uh, geometry of the object under consideration is again prismatic. Uh, here the thickness of the object is much greater than the lateral dimension of the, uh, uh, the structure. So, for a uh, model to be treated as plane strain model in x y plane uh, we need that. Uh, the object should be prismatic along z axis and it should be fixed at 2 ends z equal to 0 and z equal to L against movement in z direction and lateral dimensions as already said is uh, much smaller than the thickness. Now, the loading the should be uh, such that the surface traction and body forces are functions of x and y alone and they are independent of z and there are no body forces in z direction and uh, this is the uh, assumption on geometry and uh, loading. Now, at z equal to 0 and z equal to L, so we have uh, something like this. So, this is a valley and we are assuming z equal to 0 and z equal to L, L is the thickness in this case. Uh, we have assumed that the displacement component W is 0. Now, body is symmetric, the uh, since object is prismatic the body is symmetric about L by 2 uh, and boundary condition is symmetric loading is symmetric about this uh, z equal to L by 2 plane. Therefore, uh, we uh, obtain the uh, condition that W of x comma y L by 2 must also be equal to 0. Now, if you consider section between z equal to 0 and L by 2 uh, and we consider the plane z equal to L by 4. This will be again a plane of symmetry for the section between z equal to 0 and z equal to L by 2. For this section again loading is symmetric about z equal to L by 4 object is a prismatic and displacements are 0 at the two ends and again by virtue of uh, symmetry we get at L equal to 4 W must be 0. So, this argument can be repeatedly 
and uh, so, uh, you know we can repeat this argument to reach the conclusion that W is 0 for all Z between 0 to L. Since loading and body uh, geometry do not change with respect to Z, we also postulate that U and V are functions of X and Y alone. So this is a basic plane st strain uh, uh, model, postulates of plane strain model. As you see here, the postulates are on displacements, whereas in plane stress model, the postulates were on stresses. Now, starting with these displacements, so the root will be now from displacement, we will use strain displacement relations and obtain strains. And from the known strains, we will obtain stresses uh, completing the formulation. So now epsilon xx is dou by dou x, and since u is function of only x and y, uh, this is epsilon xx is function of x and y. Similarly, epsilon yy is function of x and y. Epsilon zz, since w is 0, uh, epsilon zz is 0. Now the shear strains, uh, this will be non zero. Whereas the other two strains, since u is independent of z, this is 0 and w is all, uh, always 0, so this is 0. And similarly, v is independent of z, therefore this is 0 and w is independent, uh, w is 0, therefore this is 0. So we get uh, th three uh, strains components to be 0. And now, given the strains, we can use the constitutive laws and obtain the stresses. So the corresponding to the shear strains, epsilon xz and epsilon yz, the corresponding stresses would be 0. But whereas all other stresses will be non-zero and they are related through uh, uh, the constitutive law for isotropic Hookean material, there will be two elastic constants. So we get uh, the stresses in terms of the strains as shown here. So E is the Young's modulus, nu is the Poisson's ratio. Now uh, based on this postulate, we can show that this will be the equilibrium equation. The third equilibrium equation will be automatically satisfied. So in this model, there will be three stress components which are not known, uh, four stress components which will not be not uh, which will not be known, and there will be three strain components and two displacement components. So there are nine unknowns, and there will be nine equations: two equilibrium, uh, three strain displacement relations, and four uh, constitutive laws. Uh, so the problem formulation thus gets completed. Now, again, we ask this question. Uh, what would happen if we substitute this model into equations of three dimensional elasticity? Will, every, will all the equations and boundary conditions be satisfied? It so happens that in plane strain model, all the field equations will be satisfied. Uh, equilibrium equation will be satisfied. Since we are starting from uh, displacements and deriving the strains, the compatibility equations will be satisfied. Uh, the constitutive laws will be satisfied, but the problem will arise in satisfying boundary conditions at z equal to 0 and L. Uh, in that sense, this model also is an approximation. <coughs> now we can show that plane stress and plane strain models are mathematically equivalent. So to convert a plane stress model into a plane strain model, we need to readjust uh, the, the value of nu in that model. So similarly, we can convert plane strain model to plane stress model by making these substitutions. Both plane stress and plane strain models are approximations. In plane stress models, we have difficulty in satisfying a few compatibility equations, and in plane strain models, we have difficulty in satisfying boundary conditions on z equal to 0 and L. So, this is the elements of theory of plane stress and plane strain model based on the linear uh, theory of linear elasticity. Now, to be able to develop the finite element model, uh, we need to write the expressions for strain energy and kinetic energy. So, to be able to do that, we reorganize the notations uh, somewhat and write now the stress as a 3 cross 1 vector, uh, 2 normal stresses and 1 shear stress and similarly uh, strain is written as 3 cross 1 vector and the constitutive law is now expressed in terms of uh, this 3 cross 1 stress vector and 3 cross 1 strain vector. D is the uh, matrix of constitutive law which is 3 cross 1. The strain displacement relations. Uh, are given by this form. Since W is 0, this gets simplified like this. Now the expression for strain energy we have seen already. This is uh, sig uh, sigma transpose epsilon dv0. Uh, v0 is a volume and uh, if 2h is the thickness, this will be the expression for um, uh, this is integral over area. And if I now use for sigma the constitutive law, 
I get this as epsilon transpose d epsilon d a. Similarly, kinetic energy is uh, half integral over the volume rho u dot square plus v dot square and over an area integral this becomes this. So, we know now the relationship between all these quantities and now we, we should be able to develop finite element models for uh, these continuum, uh, continuum elements. So, we will consider the finite element model for plane stress continuum. In the discussion of beams, uh, uh, all the structural elements were modeled as line elements. Therefore, there were no uh, questions about geometry of the element. But when we when it comes to two-dimensional uh, elements, one need to consider the geometry of the element also. So we can have thus a triangular element, a rectangular element, a quadrilateral element, or a triangular element with curved boundaries, or a quadrilateral element with curved boundaries. Now, these problems uh, represent additional difficulties where we need to deal with the uh, geometry of the uh, element. Now, if you carefully look at this, uh, the strain energy and kinetic energy will strain energy will lead to the stiffness matrix, kinetic energy will lead to the mass matrix. So, this integral over the domain, you can anticipate that that would be simple for geometries like this, but when it comes to geometries like this, uh, the integration uh, exercise becomes difficult and at that stage we will adopt numerical integration. So, we will make a substitution for coordinates and what we will do is we will map regions like this uh, into uh, re regions like this into uh, uh, unit squares and area, uh, integral will be on uh, those squares. Okay. So, we will come to that, but let us start with simpler uh, uh, you know uh, geometries. So, let us start our discussion with linear triangular plane stress element. Now, this element is characterized by 3 nodes 1, 2, 3 and the edges are 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3, 1. The nodes have coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2 and x3, y3. This is the coordinate system. Uh, u is the displacement along x direction, y, uh, v is the displacement along y direction. The displacement field within the element are the two displacement components u and v. They vary uh, within the element as functions of x, y and t. There are three independent variables, two spatial variables and one time variable. Now, what we wish to do is we want to express the variation of these field variables in the interior of the element in terms of values of these field variables at these nodes. So, to be able to do that, we begin by postulating that the displacement field can be approximated as a linear function of x and y. So, this alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 are uh, generalized coordinates which need to be determined which are functions of time. The, now, uh, I have been assuming that thickness is 2 h, but from this uh, slide onwards the thickness of the element will be h uh, to follow standard notations. Now, so I start with u equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x plus alpha 3 y. Now, at x 1 y 1 here u is given to be u 1. So, I impose that condition u 1 is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x 1 plus alpha 3 y 1. Similarly, at uh, x equal to x 2 and y equal to y 2 here, I know that u is u 2. So, that I condition I impose, I will get alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x 2 plus alpha 3 y 2. Similarly, I get the third equation. Now, <coughs> I will substitute that, uh, write this in the matrix form u 1, u 2, u 3, this is known, these are unknowns. So, this I will write it as matrix A into this unknown quantity. So, these alphas can be expressed in terms of the nodal uh, values of the field variables using this relation, where this A inverse is given, you can compute that and we get this where this quantity A naught turns out to be this. <coughs> now, uh, to formulate this what I will do is, um, I will write u as, as before alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x plus alpha 3 y and I will rewrite it as a row matrix into a column vector and for alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 based on uh, this relation. I will write it as A inverse u1, u2, u3. So, this is what I am aiming to do, write the field variable u of x, y, t in terms of 
the nodal values u1, u2, u3 and this uh, these functions serve as interpolation functions. So now I denote n1, n2, n3 as um, a inverse u1, u2, u3 uh, so that this is 1 x y a inverse uh, so that I can write u as n1 n2 n3 u1 u2 u3 thus I get u is this and similarly for v there are the other field variable there are two field variables I get a similar expression in terms of v1 v2 v3. Now I can combine the two states u and v into a single vector and write them in terms of the nodal values u1, u2, u3, v1, v2, v3 as shown here. This I will write it in a compact notation. I will write u and v, uh, the vector of uv as n into ue that e means element. Hmm. So uv is 2 cross 1 and ue is 6 cross 1 and n is 2 cross 6. So this element has 3 nodes and 6 degrees of freedom. Okay, the degrees of freedom are u1, v1, u2, v2, u3, v3. Now, <coughs> let us consider uh, uh, this uh, equation and make some observations. Now, u can be written as n1 x comma y u1 of t plus n2 x comma y u2 of t, etc. Now, since alpha has been selected so as to satisfy the conditions at nodes 1, 2, and 3, we get that if I put now uh, for n1 x y, n1 at x1 y1 must be 1, n2 x1 y1 must be 0, n3 x1 y1 must be 0. So you can write this for n1, n2, n3 and in general I can write ni of xj, comma yj is delta ij where delta ij is a Kronecker delta. Now what is the implication of this? So to understand that we will consider uh, an element A uh, the marked as 1 with edges 1, 2, 3 in some Cartesian coordinate x, y, z. I have shown here the, uh, the shape function n1 x comma y. Now <coughs> n1 x comma y we have seen it varies linearly. Now let us consider a point A lying on the edge 2, 3. Now uh, n1 of x comma y here is 0. So when I write the displacement field here u it is not affected by the nodal coordinate u1 because that will be multiplied by n1 therefore it is 0. So only u2, u3 contribute to the uh, value of a uh, display sorry that field variable at a. <coughs> so for any point a on the edge 2, 3 displacement is not affected by u1 and v1. Now let us uh, add another element 2 to this. Now by similar argument we can uh, make the statement that now A belongs to both element 1 and 2 because it is on the common boundary. Now if I look at U from the perspective of element 2 and look at uh, U from the perspective of element 1 what happens that is a question I am trying to answer. Now if, I, if you look at from the perspective of element 2 displacement field anywhere here is given in terms of nodal coordinates at 2, 3, uh, 2, 3 and 4. Now a point on this edge is not affected by value at node 4. Similarly this point uh, displacement here as a uh, viewed from element 1 is not affected by u1. So when you are looking at this point the only coordinates that affect its uh, value of the field variable here are u2 and u3 and v2 and v3. And now by the way we assemble the nodal coordinates at 2 and 3 will be common for both elements 1 and 2. That would mean that uh, the displacement field will be continuous across this edge. There would not be any uh, gaps or discontinuities here. That is the um, consequence of the way we have constructed the shape function. So upon deformation the nodes will be displaced. So all the 4 nodes will get displaced. But notwithstanding that there would be no gaps along the line 2, 3 in the displacement function. Now 
we have now uh, therefore got the displacement field in terms of nodal degrees of freedom. Now let us look at energies. Kinetic energy uh, is h by 2 uh, evaluated over the area integral rho u dot square plus v dot square. Now this I will write it in this form u dot v dot transpose u dot v dot and for u dot v dot I will write this uh, use this n into u e so that becomes u e transpose n transpose and for u dot v dot it is n into u dot e and integration is on d a naught. So uh, this u dot, uh, u dot of e is independent of area coordinate so that can be pulled out. So the integral will be over only this quantity n transpose and n. So I can write in this form and get the strain energy in the form of half u dot transpose m e u dot and this m e which is a quantity inside this bracket is the element mass matrix. So to be able to derive the elements of m e I need to carry out this integration. Now n and uh, we have already determined n so I can substitute that there are polynomials in this case and the, uh, we can carry out this integration and we get this uh, mass matrix. In this case I am able to evaluate this in, uh, integral in closed form. So I get this mass matrix this is the consistent uh, element mass matrix. So uh, it is 6 by 6 because there are 6 degrees of freedom uh, this is a 6 by 6 symmetric mass matrix. The, the components of this are the thickness of the element, area of cross section and the mass density. Now how about strain energy? The stress 3 cross 1 stress vector has element sigma xx, yy, sigma xy and this is the strain also. Now sigma is related to epsilon through this uh, D matrix and the uh, strain is related to displacement through this relation. So this I write it as now for u and v as we have just seen I write it as n into u and I write it as b u e where b is the this matrix this product this product. Now I have now sigma transpose epsilon dv naught as a, uh, sigma transpose epsilon as the integrand. So I will write this this over volume this over the area it becomes this and sigma transpose I will write it as epsilon transpose into d d is a symmetric matrix so d transpose is d and I get epsilon here and uh, this uh, epsilon now I will write in terms of the shape function and this b matrix this again leading to um, u transpose b transpose db u e d a. Now again this, is, this u is a uh, function of only time it is independent of spatial variable so it can be pulled out and I get this matrix as h into uh, area integral integral over the area b transpose db d a naught. So this quantity is called the element stiffness matrix. Here again to evaluate elements of this we have to explore uh, the elements of this matrix and in fact we can show that in this particular example uh, b into this n uh, th this uh, the matrix th th this into n will be this and this is independent of uh, uh, x and y. So consequently what happens this integration can be done uh, uh, easily and we can pull out uh, that and we get uh, k e as h a naught b transpose db. So b is independent of x and y and hence this element is called constant strain triangle CST. Now epsilon is given by b u e sigma is given by db so and this is constant over the element. Now, so thus we have derived now the element stiffness matrix and mass matrix. Now the steps which follow development of structural matrices that is beyond this step that will trans transformation to global coordinates, assembling of different matrices uh, which constitute the built up structure and imposition of boundary conditions and evaluation of nodal forces leading to the final equilibrium equations uh, would be similar to those described in the context of analysis of frames. So we need not have to revisit that problem there will be some variations in uh, implementing those steps but conceptually uh, the details remains similar. Now we have dealt with triangular element and uh, we can now look at rectangular elements. So 
I consider a rectangular element of dimensions 2a and 2b. Uh, I, will, I will consider the problem of an element having 4 nodes 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is a 4 noded rectangular element with 8 degrees of freedom because at every node we have 2 unknowns u and v. So, it is 8 degrees of freedom. Now, what I do is we introduce uh, new coordinate system called natural coordinates. Um, psi is x by a and eta is y by b. The consequence of making this substitution is that this rectangular region now gets mapped to a square of psi dimensions sides 2. So, the origin at 0 0 and the vertices are at plus minus 1 okay, x equal to plus minus 1 and y equal to plus minus 1. Now, the advantage of this is as we saw we are going to evaluate mass and elements of mass and stiffness matrices by carrying out a quadrature over this area and by making this substitution the evaluation of those integrals become simple and systematic. So, again we start with uh, displacement field we assume that it is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 x plus alpha 3 y plus alpha 4 x y. Uh, similarly, v is um, a constant plus linear functions in x and y and quadratic terms in x y. I will, I will uh, discuss why it should be chosen in this form. Uh, subsequently. So, the field variable is u of suppose you consider field variable u of x y comma t it needs to be interpolated in terms of values at 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, there are 4 constants uh, which has to be used for interpolation and we select 1 x y and x y as the basis functions to construct those uh, in, you know, interpolants. Now, how do we evaluate this alpha i we again follow the same procedure. Uh, we use the fact that at the nodal values x i y i it is u i of t and uh, we can obtain alpha in terms of u i for i equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. Similarly, for v we again follow the same logic and we get this. So, concept this involves certain details, but conceptually it is simple. As I already said it is advantageous to introduce that these transformations. So, upon making these transformations we write the field variables in terms of in uh, x i and eta coordinate as shown here. So, u is approximated in terms of uh, the nodal values u 1, u 2, u 3, u 4 in terms of these interpolation functions n 1, n 2, n 3, n 4 this is function of x i and eta. Similarly, v is interpolated uh, using the same interpolation function. Now, the function this interpolation function should be such that uh, they have this Kronecker delta property n j of x i comma eta i must be delta i j. So, uh, we can show that uh, this n 1, n 2, n 3, n 4 can be obtained in this particular form. So, you can quickly see that uh, at node 1 the coordinates are minus 1, minus 1. Uh, so, uh, this will be 1 and at all other values uh, eta n 1 will be 0 that means at all other vertices it will be 0. Similarly, you can verify that this condition is satisfied for these 4. Uh, function and all these 4 functions can be compactly written in a single notation as shown here nj of x i comma eta is written like this for i equal to j uh, j equal to 1 2 3 4 and eta x i and eta j takes values plus minus 1 at the vertices. Now, again we can examine the nature of these interpolation functions suppose if I consider an element 1 2 3 4 with nodes 1 2 3 4 and consider the function interpolation function n 1 mm. at node 1 its value is 1 and we can see on edge 1 2 where eta is minus 1 <coughs> n 1 of uh, psi comma eta is half of 1 uh, 1 minus psi x psi. So, similarly 3 4 I get this 2 3 I get this 4 1 I get this. So, that means displace again the argument is suppose if I add one more element here and consider um, the value of suppose I consider a point A and if I were to add one more element uh, the question of what uh, the point here belongs to this element as well as this element. So, would the displacement be continuous across this edge if you examine these relations you will conclude that displacement should be continuous across the element boundary.
Now what are the nodal degrees of freedom? U1, V1, U2, V2, U3, V3, U4, V4. So all that I assemble in a single vector 8 cross 1 vector and I define this matrix of uh, interpolation functions as shown here so that I will be able to write uv as n into ue as before. So the structure of this representation remains the same but the dimensions of these matrices vary. This is 8 cross 1 and this will be 2 cross 8. Now again I have for kinetic energy I will use this relation rho u dot transpose u dot dv naught and uh, by using this relation I get this uh, expression and now to evaluate this integral first I will do over the thickness area it becomes area integral uh, this is rho a b h and integration is from minus 1 to plus 1 it is n transpose n d psi d eta. Now we have seen that this n1, n2, n3, n4 are uh, polynomials in xi and eta, uh, eta therefore in the evaluation of this integration is not difficult. Uh, so we can uh, carry out So Me gets uh, uh, represented in this form and the typical element Me ij is in the form Ni uh, xi eta into Nj xi eta d xi d eta. So now for Ni and Nj I can write the expression that we have already derived and I can show that this integrand gets separated into one integral over xi another integral over eta and these are simple polynomials or uh, uh, simple limits so the, these can be evaluated exactly in a straightforward manner. So this particular example does not pose any difficulty. So far we have not any encountered any difficulty in evaluating these integrals. Consequently I will get now the 8 by 8 consistent mass matrix uh, for the element. It is symmetric uh, and the, the quantities that enter the formulations of mass matrix are the density and uh, dimensions of the uh, element and this is free from any other parameters. Similarly strain energy we consider V as uh, this is the expression for strain energy uh, in terms of strains and the constitutive uh, matrix of constitutive coefficients. So again if I use this representation as before uh, I get uh, now of course the dimensions of these quantities will vary but the mathematically the structure of this uh, you know the form will remain the same. So uh, the integrand now becomes uh, uh, you know u e transpose b transpose d b u e and the stiffness matrix is obtained as a b h integral minus 1 to plus 1 uh, b transpose d b d psi d eta. Now this is the element um, stiffness matrix. So here again you can show that uh, in this particular case we will be still be able to evaluate this integral in closed form okay. So the B matrix in this case for a simplification I have given it here uh, which can be used to evaluate that integral. <coughs> so D transpose DB uh, you can see that uh, this will be quadratic functions if you put that and you will be able to evaluate the uh, elements of stiffness matrix. So in summary we have the stiffness matrix and the mass matrix uh, and as I was mentioning in cases considered so far it has been possible to evaluate these integrals in closed form. If the element geometry is not simple uh, like triangle or tri rectangle as we have been considering we need to resort to numerical integrations to evaluate these integrals. So this leads to uh, questions uh, I mean what is known as isoparametric formulation and we will see that in due course. Now before we proceed further with element development we can consider a few examples. The first example that I have taken is on a uh, sh shear uh, wall like this uh, dimensions are and elastic properties are shown here. Uh, thickness is about 0 0.2 to 86 meters uh, and you can see that the conditions for plane stress modeling um, prevails and uh, the problem is uh, to determine the first 5 natural frequencies and normal modes and we can also use Timoshenko beam theory for this and uh, arrive at the natural frequencies from a beam theory and we can see how these results compare. What we can what we are going to do now is we will develop different models for this using triangle elements and using rectangular elements with different mesh densities and see how the results behave. So the first uh, discretization is the as shown here uh, we use uh, triangular plane stress elements 
in this model there are 32 elements and 48 degrees of freedom and you can formulate the k and m matrices and if you evaluate the natural frequencies uh, the first five frequencies are listed here and uh, based on the examination of normal modes which I will uh, be showing shortly uh, the second and the uh, four, fifth mode in this particular model turn out to be axial uh, deformation model that means oscillations are predominantly in this direction otherwise they are flexure. So how do the mode shapes look like? This is the first mode shape flexure the second one is axial deformation this is again flexure flexure axial deformation flexure. Now how do we know that this is acceptable? So to proceed further we have to refine the mesh. So the thing that I do is I will refine the mesh as shown here. In any mesh refinement problem the idea of refinement should be such that the nodes that we have produced in this model should again be remain uh, as nodes in the refined model. So if you see carefully I have uh, uh, all the original uh, nodes in the first model are retained here but the number of elements have increased. So in this case there are 128 elements and there are 160 degrees of freedom and if I use uh, again the free vibration if I perform the free vibration analysis I get the natural frequencies as shown here. In this model the second mode becomes flexural model and third mode model becomes axial model. Here these frequencies have not yet converged with respect to the element size. So the errors in different natural frequencies need not be the same. So if the if the first second mode and third mode have different amounts of errors and they are converging at different rates the order in which they appear will also switch. So that is what happens here you can see here uh, model the second natural frequency is axial model whereas here the it becomes third mode. Now how do we how do the mode shape look like you can see here this is the first mode this is the second mode this is axial mode third mode this is a fourth mode. These are the higher modes and I get uh, uh, two higher order bending modes and axial deformation modes. It is difficult to discern the patterns of axial deformation uh, there will be nodes and things like that that is not easy to determine because the deformations are shown in the direct the uh, deformed geometry is also shown in the same direction. So it will not be easy to uh, delineate whether uh, where is a node and things like that. Now if we summarize these three models. Uh, also uh, somewhere I indicated here if we do a Timoshenko beam theory and compute the natural frequencies exactly there is no finite element model I get the natural frequencies to be this. The first two modes are flexural modes third one is axial uh, fourth one is flexure and fifth one is again axial. So if we tabulate this uh, for model 1 the if I assume that since this analytical model and natural frequencies have been computed exactly and also the geometry of the structure is such that Timoshenko beam theory uh, is likely to be valid uh, we can treat that as more exact than these two if we agree with that postulate we can see that uh, the first model uh, has 6.39 the next one is 5.35 they seem to be moving towards this value of 4.97. Here the second mode is the axial mode and that should be compared with this mode this is 31.99 31.95 and this is actually 31.944. So what do we see? We will we'll come to that point again. Now the third second mode this 26.391 it is 27.58 and that has to be compared with 32.19. So 32.19 and 27.58 are approximations to 26.39. Similarly now the higher modes you can compare and the thing that we can observe is the axial modes are captured well. For example 31.99, 31.95 are good approximation 30 to 31.944 whereas 32.19, 27.58 and 26.391 are relatively poorer approximations. Uh, so similarly first mode 6.39 and 5.35 are approximations to 4.97. So the moral of the story is in triangular elements the axial modes are more accurately captured than bending modes. It is not a quite a satisfactory situation because this model is already fairly complicated. 
in spite of it we are not getting uh, good results. Now let us solve this problem using rectangular elements. So let us start with uh, this discretization uh, again uh, everything remains same uh, for this discretization it has 160 degrees of freedom and it is same as this okay. So now the model that I get is 5.03 which is for approximation to 4 0.97, 26.22, 26.39, 31, 31.95, 61, 62, 96, 95. So the uh, here in addition to uh, axial modes being captured well uh, with uh, rectangular elements where we are also able to capture uh, bending modes with uh, higher level of satisfac satisfaction. So the mode shapes are shown here uh, the ordering matches with the order that is observed in Timoshenko beam. So from this one could conclude that rectangular elements behave better than triangular elements at least for the examples that we have considered. Another example that we can consider is that of a, a triangular wedge hmm, which can serve as a model for an uh, earth dam and one can analyze this triangular wedge as a shear beam and you can uh, since the variation is linear we can uh, that the area of cross section variation is linear along the height uh, we will be able to get an exact solution in terms of Bessel's functions that is available in the literature. So this example now if we analyze using plane stress elements uh, plane strain element this will be now a plane strain problem uh, because this is an embankment problem. Uh, so how do how does our models behave so the first uh, <coughs> uh, scheme of modeling is shown here and here we have 42 elements and 42 degrees of freedom and uh, th this this uh, these nodes will be fixed at the bottom and the first few frequencies in hertz we obtain as 1.25 2.67 3.70 4.0 4.1 and from the shear beam model uh, analytically computed natural frequencies are shown here. How do the mode shapes look like? These are the mode shapes. So now uh, this uh, uh, you know should give us an idea on uh, within an element how well are we are uh, you know approximating the deformation fields. Okay. Uh, now the same problem can be tackled using of course refined triangular mesh and so on and so forth but we can also use combination of rectangular and triangular elements. So an illustration for that this is not a very good mesh uh, is not something that I recommend for you to use but it is it serves to illustrate how triangular and rectangular elements can be used in the same model. So for this part uh, we have used triangular elements similarly triangular elements here, triangular elements here and for this part we have used rectangular elements. Now again you know we compute uh, natural frequencies and the natural frequencies turn out to be this. So the mode shapes are obtained uh, as shown here, uh, you can see the shear deformation type of behavior here and uh, this is mode 1 this is mode 2, this is mode 3 and this is mode 4. Now we can do this problem more systematically by refining the mesh in an orderly way uh, maybe at some point I will show how that can be done and we can understand how these natural frequencies behave with respect to uh, the refinement in mesh. But the uh, idea of showing these illustrations uh, here is to simply illustrate that the two elements that we have developed can be used uh, to solve this problem and mind you for this type of geometry uh, entire machine cannot be done with only rectangular element we, we will end up using triangular elements to capture these details at the corners at least uh, the remaining part can be meshed with rectangular elements but when it comes to these corners we will end up requiring triangular elements. Now this shows us that there will be situations where simple geometries like uh, rectangle and triangle may not suffice. So we need to deal with 
uh, more complicated geometries uh, such as this. So how do we proceed? So what we do is the basic idea of considering different geometries is uh, we have some Cartesian coordinates x and y. So a point here has coordinates x and y. Now I will introduce a mapping so that this region it gets mapped to a square uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, vertices at plus minus 1 as shown here. So this I call it as x i and eta. Now a point here gets mapped to a point somewhere here. So we can assume that x is function of x i and eta, y is function of x i and eta. Now the idea is that we will now represent this in terms of the nodal values okay, and use the same interpolation function that we have used for deriving the shape function uh, for uh, repl uh, representing the displacement field. Okay. So what did we do for displacement field? Uh, we wrote uh, the nodal values and these interpolation functions. Okay. Now I will use the same interpolation functions and represent these coordinates in x i eta plane. So that means the geometry of the element is also approximated using the same shape functions uh, which were used in representing the field variables. So this formulation is known as isoparametric formulation. Now if we go back and um, look at the structure of the stiffness and mass matrices, we have got stiffness and mass matrices in this form. So this, these integrals will now be in the form of, uh, will now be with respect to the natural coordinates x i and eta. So this function because of the nature of transformations involved will no longer be simple functions which admit closed form solutions. So what we do is we use uh, numerical integration schemes to derive the elements of Ke and Me. That uh, specifically what we use is uh, the Gauss quadrature uh, rules are used to represent uh, to evaluate these integrals. So what we will do in the next class is we will uh, introduce the isoparametric uh, formulation and derive the uh, mass and stiffness matrices for uh, quadrilateral element and revisit some of these problems and see how best we can what would happen if I use quadrilateral elements and solve the problem. So with this we will conclude today's uh, lecture.